either acute or it's either chronic, okay? Acute means the onset is very rapid. Chronic means it's slow growing, okay? Then we talked about how we diagnose it. Remember, we look at labs, and then we're gonna do a bone marrow biopsy and aspiration to kind of determine what type of leukemia does this individual have. So once we've identified that they have leukemia, let's talk about our treatment options, okay? So with leukemia, one of our gold standards is chemotherapy. Now, the type of chemotherapy that we use is something we call combo chemo, okay? It is a very, very strong form of chemo. Okay. What we are doing is we are using multiple chemotherapy agents and giving them to this person. So, in your book on page 379, okay, this is in chapter 20, because I know it's been a while maybe since y'all have talked about treatments for cancers, but they're presented to you in chapter 20. So you need to take some time and read over that because a lot of what we deal with as far as our people that have leukemias and our lymphomas is dealing with the side effects of chemo and radiation, okay? So radiation is talked about from page 379 to 382, okay? Chemo is talked about from page 382 to 392. And then when we look at immunotherapy or target therapy that we talked about last week, it's presented in your book from 392 to 395, okay? But one of our gold standards for leukemia is chemo, guys. We do combo chemo. So the type of chemo that we use is very, very intense. Uh, so some things we need to talk to the patient about before they start this type of chemo. Um, if fertility is an issue, if they still want to have kids at some point, then what we recommend, we, uh, we recommend sperm banking, egg harvesting. Because I know y'all all have heard stories about people getting pregnant after chemo. And yes, sometimes that occurs. But the type of agents we use, we use multiple chemo drugs. And the more chemo drugs you add on, the more side effects you have. And so they tend to um, cause sterility. Okay. So we address that before we even start. So there's three phases in how we treat these people. Phase one, we call it induction. We're given a very, very high, intense chemo. Okay. This is when your patient is the sickest. So there's three reasons why we choose to do combo chemo. Number one, it decreases drug resistance. Number two, it minimizes drug toxicity. And guys, the way it does that is because we're using all these multiple drugs and they all have varying levels of toxicity. And then the third reason we use combo chemo is that we interrupt cell growth at multiple stages, okay? So in the induction phase, phase one, our whole goal is to kill off all leukemic cells. That's our whole goal, okay? We wanna put them in remission. Remission meaning they don't have any cancer. So that's our focus during this phase one phase, okay? Now, phase two is something we call consolidation. And really what happens in the consolidation phase, we give additional doses of chemo. And you probably are thinking, well, gosh, why would you do that? You achieved remission. Well, what you need to remember is sometimes people have leukemic cells but their numbers are so small that our blood work doesn't detect it right away, okay? So we think of this phase two, this consolidation, think of it as an insurance policy. Yes, we've given you chemo and we've destroyed all these cells, but you know what? There might be a few little renegade cells out there that just haven't gotten large enough to where we can detect them, so I'm gonna give you some more chemo, just in case, okay? 
That's your phase two, that's consolidation. Now during phase one and phase two, we're using very, very intense chemo. And oftentimes with this type of chemo, we like to give it through a central line or a port, okay? That's our preferred method. However, some of these agents you actually can give IV. However, you've got to be really careful because it is a vesicant. So remember, a vesicant just means that it will cause damage to the surrounding tissue. So in your book on page 384, when you're doing your reading, take a few minutes and look at the figure 20-2. Okay, so what happened here is this individual had chemo and the chemo leaked into the surrounding tissue because the IV infiltrated and it destroyed the surrounding tissue. That's a great example of it. So if you're given chemo, one, you have to be chemo certified. So just realize that there's additional classes you have to take to be able to give chemo, be it IV or PO. Because remember with your PO drugs, they're just as toxic as your IV drugs. Okay, so you gotta be trained in doing that. Remember with chemo drugs, your PO chemo drugs, you never ever crush them, okay? When you handle them, you better wear gloves because it can be absorbed through your skin. So you just need additional training there. So you gotta be really, really careful, and that's what we like to give them through a central line, and we like to give them through ports, but there's lots of reasons people aren't candidates for central lines and ports. So just be aware of that, okay? So after we have achieved remission in phase one, we give that insurance policy in phase two, the consolidation, and then in phase three, we consider that our maintenance period, okay? So our whole goal in phase three is to continue to keep them free of leukemic cells. That's our whole goal. So the way we manage that is we give them chemo drugs, but typically what we do at this point, this is when we switch them over to the PO, okay? Now, depending on what type of leukemia they have and their overall clinical picture, it's gonna vary as far as how long they'll be in this maintenance therapy, okay? For most people, it lasts anywhere from two to five years. So realize that that depends on a lot of things, okay? So that is our whole goal during that maintenance therapy, that they stay free of leukemia. Now, to help them along, because remember, the problem with chemo is it's not selective, guys. Okay, remember it kills the good and the bad. That's the problem with chemo. So we have additional medications um, and therapies that we use. One of those is something we call biological response modifiers. Um, they're pretty cool. What they do is they enhance, or they can even alter the patient's own immune system to where the patient's immune system becomes more efficient at fighting these cancerous cells, at identifying and destroying them. Okay. One way it does that is, uh, for example, when we use interferons, okay? That stimulates the growth of NK cells. So NK, cell, NK cells are something that you have. They're called natural killer cells, okay? Everybody has natural killer cells. What they are most, or I should say, the best thing they're good at is, is, is recognizing self versus non-self cells. So it's abnormal cells, they're really good at detecting them and destroying them. So if we enhance with these modifiers the patient's own immune system to where they're producing more of these natural killer cells, what's gonna happen is that patient's own immune system becomes more responsive to those abnormal cells. It notices them far faster and it gets rid of them quicker, okay? So that's what I mean by a modifier. It modifies the immune system in some form or fashion to where it becomes more effective. The problem is when you start messing with the immune system, um, for example, like these interferons, there are some side effects. A lot of times what happens is it causes like an inflammatory response so what you'll see is you'll sometimes see the redness, the developing of a rash. Um, they can have flu-like symptoms, some nausea, vomiting, those types of things, okay? So there is that potential for more side effects with that. The other thing, as I put up here, it can cause neuropathy. So remember with peripheral neuropathy, essentially what that is, it's where the person's, um, 
their feeling is not as well in their extremities. So oftentimes what they complain about is the tingling and numbness in the extremities, okay? So oftentimes we have to treat it with medication. Hey, what's one medication we give for that? Y'all gave it yesterday. Neurotin. Neurotin, gabapentin, absolutely, okay? So that's one example, okay? We were trying to boost immunity, but oftentimes when we start these modifiers, because there is that potential for a reaction, we bring them in the inpatient setting, okay? Just so we know how they're gonna respond, and if they have some type of reaction that we need to treat, we can treat it very rapidly, okay? Some other things we'd like to use, targeted therapy, guys. Remember targeted therapy, why we like it? Is because it acts on very specific components that are needed for the leukemic cell production and growth. So other things I like to talk about. So remember with chemo, you destroy good and bad. So oftentimes with chemo, you have something called pancytopenia. So remember, pancytopenia is just a reduction in all of your cells. So if I'm destroying my normal platelets, I gotta give you something to help increase that. And that's your Numega. It increases platelet production. I can give epigen, and oftentimes we give epigen because epigen is gonna help the erythrocytes. What are erythrocytes important in? Oxygen. Absolutely, red blood cells, oxygen transport, okay? So I'll give medication to stimulate the production of those erythrocytes that are needed for that. Okay. And filgrastin, what that's gonna do? That's going to increase neutrophils. What do neutrophils help with? Y'all remember? White blood cells, yes. Okay. So oftentimes when you give someone combo chemo, you're gonna see these additional therapies added on to try and combat the negativity that's involved with the chemo, the, the destroying of the good cells along with the bad cells, okay? So you'll see those a lot. Now, the other thing I like for you to think about, okay, is that you as a nurse, you have to deal with these side effects. You need to know what interventions you should use. Okay, so think about it. One thing you need to anticipate the side effects that are gonna come about because of the chemo, and then what should I do? We're gonna talk about some of these, okay? Because here's the thing you have to realize. As an RN, you look at one, physical health, two, mental health, okay? And then emotional health. You gotta, you gotta do all three, not just worry about doing tasks. That's not your role anymore. So when we look at some of the side effects of chemo, guys, think about it. And while I know you think some of these aren't that big of a deal, to some people they might be. For example, alopecia. Who wants to lose their hair? Nobody. Exactly. I know, see? Jay is very <laughs> traumatized by that, so don't mention it. We'll just act like you have a head full. Okay? To some people, it is very traumatizing to lose your hair. And the way you lose your hair with this chemo, it's not pretty, you lose it in clumps, okay? So oftentimes, before we start chemo, we talk about the fact that they're gonna lose their hair. Now, with some chemo, you don't lose hair, but the type we're using, we're using multiple different chemo agents, okay? They're gonna lose their hair. So oftentimes what we do is we talk to the patient about giving them some power and going ahead and, and shaving their hair, cutting it off, cut it short, okay? So it's not as traumatizing when it falls out. We also talk about you can wear um, scarves or wigs. Here's the thing that maybe some of y'all don't know, but wigs are really, really expensive. They're very hot and they're very itchy, okay? But what we like to do is right when we start therapy, we like to get them in to go ahead and get them fitted for a wig, okay? Um, if they don't have the resources for wigs, we do have companies out there that provide. It's just a process, okay? 
So we would have to notify and make sure our case managers are involved because it takes time. It's not like you request it today and you get it tomorrow. So oftentimes we'll talk to them about that, but think about it. Think about how much that your how much that when you have a good hair day versus a bad hair day, how much that can affect your self-esteem. Okay? It really can. And so we can't belittle someone's concern that they're losing their hair. Other things that we have to deal with. So remember, chemo kills good along with that. So oftentimes, your patient will develop um, stomitis, they'll develop thrush. And the reason that is, is remember all the cells in your mucosa lining, they shed really, really fast. And so with chemo, they shed even faster. Okay, so oftentimes, stomitis, all it is is inflammation in the mouth. Typically, they develop little ulcer-like sores all in their mouth. Okay, it's very, very painful. And then thrush, remember thrush is like a yeast. Um, for those of you who've had kids, it's like the white tongue you see sometimes with, with babies. So that's something that's very common, and so we need to be aware of that. With, to help prevent or to help reduce some of this, one, we always recommend that they do frequent normal saline rinses, especially after they eat, so they don't get any food particles caught in there and that could irritate it even more. We also advise them to make sure that they avoid acidic or spicy foods, because of course that's gonna make it worse because you have all these open lesions in there. If they have thrush, what we, one, wanna educate on is not pulling the white spots off. Because what happens is thrush over time that it'll start looking like your tongue's peeling and you'll have these white little flaky things. And as a nurse, one of the first things we wanna do, we wanna get rid of it. We wanna just pull that off. Don't do it, it's very painful. It'll come off on its own. But the other thing we wanna do is let's do like some swish and swallow, some magic mouthwash, um, some of the niastatin rinses to, to treat that thrush and get rid of it. Because remember, it hurts, they're not gonna to wanna to eat. So we know that nausea and vomiting is an issue. Oftentimes, with people that are getting chemo, we premedicate. We know they're gonna get nauseated, so let's go ahead and give them something, okay? The reason we wanna combat their nausea and vomiting is think about their nutrition. We know if you are nauseated and you are vomiting, it's gonna decrease your desire to eat. We need these people to eat because we need them to have high protein so they can build back up what they're losing, okay? So we gotta get a hand on the nausea and vomiting. One thing that helps with that is small frequent meals, okay? So that's what you're gonna promote, like those six little meals a day versus like three big meals. They can tolerate that. We also want them to have high protein, nutrient rich foods. We like them to have high calorie foods. Now, that being said, you might do some education because, for example, while McDonald's is high calorie, it's not good for you, okay? So we want them to have high calorie, but food that's good for them, that's gonna build them up. So those are just some of the things that we educate on. Fatigue, okay? So fatigue is a really big deal with them. The fatigue is related to, one, the chemo drugs that they're taking, but also, remember, they're having destruction of red blood cells. Anytime you have destruction of red blood cells, remember that can cause anemia. Anemia can cause the fatigue because you don't have enough transport for the oxygen. So oftentimes, we have to educate on they need to have rest periods. Naps are not a bad thing, okay? And so a lot of times what we have to do is we just have to let them know while you're doing treatment, you're not gonna have the same energy level you did prior to. It's gonna take a while before that comes back. And just be realistic with it. Most people, while they're undergoing chemo, are unable to work, okay? Because they just can't handle the side effects. And the fatigue, it's a, it's a really major fatigue, okay? So then we gotta address that issue. Uh, something else that happens, they do have some memory changes sometimes. It's called chemo brain, you might have heard of that. but. This can come on very quickly and can resolve very quickly. However, sometimes people have long-term uh, results, or I should say long-term um, memory changes because of the chemo. Because remember, we are putting a toxic agent into a person. You're gonna have some side effects. So if you have a patient and they have chemo brain is what we term it, okay? Things you need to remember. These people cannot multitask. 
So we stress the importance of doing one thing at a time. So you need to know that when you go in there and educate. If you're going in there and educating a patient who has chemo brain, and you're going to educate them about all their discharge meds, and there's like 12 of them, how effective do you think that's going to be at that point in time? Not very. They're not going to remember any of it. So we stress the importance of completing one task at a time. Let's focus on one thing. And then also the importance of a daily planner. Okay. So in addition to having a daily planner, they got to look at it. Because how often do we have a daily planner where we write everything down and then we never check it? Well, I'm guilty of that. Okay? So we got to talk to them about making sure they're checking it. And then other things that happens, I talked to you about sterility. Okay? Because sterility happens in the majority of our patients. But a lot of people forget to talk to them about the sexual changes they're going to experience. For women and men both, it's a lack of sexual desire. They just don't feel like it. And then also with your men, they can have impotence. Please, please, please reassure them it's just short term. It's not permanent, okay? So those are the things when we educate, we gotta educate them. We wanna make sure and tell them that these, they're expected, they're normal to have these side effects. What you got for me? Impotence. Okay. Oftentimes, our patients that are going through chemo treatment, they develop neutropenia, okay? Not all patients do. That's a misconception that everybody thinks if they, if a patient is going through chemo or has leukemia, they're on neutropenic precautions. That's not true, okay? So realize, when you talk about neutropenia, it is when the person has, we only put them on precautions when they have a abnormally small amount of neutrophils, okay? That's when we implement neutropenic precautions. Now, caring for a patient who's on neutropenic precautions, it is on Mark 3, 22, 3, it is on page 388. Okay. And let's talk about some of these precautions. So remember with, people get contact precautions and neutropenic precautions confused. They mean two different things. Okay? Neutropenic precautions means that I'm protecting the patient from my germs because they're not able to effectively fight off infections at this point. So I've got to reduce the number of, of germs they come in contact with. So therefore, anytime I go into that patient's room, I'm wearing a gown, mask, and gloves. When I go into the room, I wash my hands and then I put on my gloves. Please, please, please don't ever get offended if you walk into a patient's room who is um, undergoing treatment and they ask you to wash your hands. Don't get offended by that because that's one of the gold standards we tell them. Because it's easier to prevent infection than it is to treat infection. Okay? So other things you need to remember. So remember with neutropenic precautions, we want them in a, their own room. We don't want them to have any partners. There are still some hospitals that have semi-private rooms. We want them to have a private room. Remember, no standing water anywhere. Um, no fresh flowers. No fresh fruits or vegetables. Why? Bacteria, absolutely. Okay? They can have cooked vegetables and cooked fruit all day long because we do want them to have nutrient-rich foods, but it needs to be cooked. Okay? Other things you have to realize when you have a patient who has neutropenia, you really have to monitor their vital signs very, very closely, okay? Because their immune system is impaired, a temp, degree, a temp change of one point is significant, could be significant in this population. So you treat it very aggressively. Other thing we want to make sure is we want to make sure that we assess their skin because their skin and their oral mucosa because that might be their only line of defense. Because as I said, it's easier to prevent something than it is to fix something. 
So if this is an individual you want to make sure you do a really good skin assessment on. You want to turn them every two hours if they're at risk for any type of skin breakdown. Okay. You might have to help them with the oral care. Make sure you inspect their oral mucosa. The other thing we want to make sure and talk about is we used to say no visitors, but we've changed that, okay, to where we limit visitors. They can have people that come see them. However, two groups you want to stay away. Who do you, what two groups do you think that is? Kids. Yeah, children and sick people do not come in because they both carry lots of germs, okay? And the reason we the reason we change that to no visitors and limit visitors is because think about it. Oftentimes, you have no one come and visit you, your patient becomes very socially isolated, leads to depression. So remember, we also have to look at things just beside their physical well-being. We have to think about their emotional and their mental well-being. Okay. And in that, in your on page 388, you have a great little chart that talks to you about care of a patient who has neutropenia. Okay. Other things we need to worry about, realize they're at a risk for bleeding. So we gotta be careful of that. On page 389, you have a great little chart that talks about how do you prevent um, injury in patients. The other thing we have to look at is we do not want them to get infection at all, okay? So things you need to be aware of and we need to make sure and educate the patient on. One, when they go home, they need to avoid crowds, okay? Avoid crowds, avoid sick people. Not to share personal items. Okay? We need to teach them how to wash hands or make sure they know how to wash hands. Don't assume, guys, that gets us in trouble so often when we assume. I want you to think about it. How often have you gone to a restaurant, you've gone to the restroom, the person that gets on using the restroom beside you and they just walk out and never wash their hands? It happens, okay? So don't assume that people wash their hands all the time and don't assume they're washing them correctly. For example, my son, I just assumed when I told him to wash his hands like he was washing with soap, right? Because that's what you do. No, first off he's upset because I didn't pee on my hands, why do I have to wash them? Okay, my son's eight, this happened when he was about five. And then why do I need to use soap? So I just had to, the rule of the house was if you touch a worm, you wash your hands with soap. Okay, that's just how it was. But he didn't, like soap, he was like, well, I put my hand on the water, they're good. No darling, you need some soap on there too. So just make sure because there are a lot of people that don't wash their hands guys, they don't feel like they need to. So we gotta educate on that. Okay, um, again, we want to make sure that they take their temperature at least once a day. We need that baseline, okay? Because remember, we're going to get really concerned if we have an increase from their baseline. So we've got to be careful about that. When we treat leukemias, our gold standard, of course, is combo chemo. That is our gold standard, okay? Another option that we have, we can do a bone marrow transplant. Here's the thing, not everybody's a candidate for bone marrow transplant. It's great to say it, and I, everybody loves to talk about, oh, you just get a bone marrow transplant. It's not that easy, okay? And let's talk about why it's not that easy. So, when you do a bone marrow transplant, what we essentially are doing is the patients Cell, stem cells don't work like they should, okay? So we're replacing the patient's own immune system with functioning stem cells, healthy stem cells, okay? Well, here's the thing. Before we can do a bone marrow transplant, we have to make sure that we have a donor, okay? So let's talk about how that process works. Let's say that I need a bone marrow transplant, okay? Let's say Jay's kind enough and he's gonna give me some stem cells, okay? 
if we don't have the same HLA type, it doesn't matter how much Jay is willing to give to me, my body's going to recognize that as not self-self, and it's going to destroy it. So the first thing we have to do, guys, is we got to find a match. So when you look at it, what I want you to think about when you think about HLA, HLA stands for human leukocyte um, antigen. It is actually a protein that's found on the surface of all your cells in your body. Okay? It's what makes you unique. This HLA type. I want you to think about it as a universal barcode. So it doesn't matter what cells of J's I look at, they're all going to have the HLA type, and it's going to be unique to him only. The only exception to that is if you have an identical twin. Anybody here have an identical twin? Then we're all unique, guys. Okay? All of us are unique. So unless I put in, I should say, unless I put in tissues that have that exact HLA type, what's going to happen is your body's going to recognize that as foreign and is going to attack it. Okay? So that's that's that the key to self-recognition and self-tolerance is your HLA type. The thing about HLA types is we try and find matches within the family first because those are, of course, our, our prime candidates right there. But again, it's not a guarantee. Okay? So if we can't find someone in the family that isn't an HLA type, okay, the exact, or as close as possible, that's our, that's our deal, we get as close as possible, then our option that way is we have to look outside of the family. So we look at things, um, we have a registry, it's called bethematch.org. It's a registry where you can, you send in um, swab samples and they match your HLA and they put you in this big database. So if a person needs a stem cell transplant, they run the database, if they find that you have a matching HLA, then what we do is we try and contact that person to see if they're willing to donate some, some of their stem cells. So here's the thing, if we can't find a match, then a bone marrow transplant is not an option and that person's going to die. So that's why in healthcare one of our biggest things is we try and get as many people as possible to be on the registry. Okay? Because the bigger you make your pool, the more likelihood of developing or of finding a match. Who do you think the hardest people to match are? Give me some, um, give me some races you think would be hard to match. Hispanics. Hispanics. Okay. Native Americans. Native Americans. Pacific Islanders. Pacific Islanders. Thank you. Thinking outside the box. What else we got? African Americans. Why? So glad you said that. Why? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so for African Americans, one of the biggest, um, they are the lowest percentage of donors, period. Okay? And most of it revolves around their religion. Okay? Yeah, it's a whole world. You have their religion and they just don't. Uh, there's a misconception that if you say you're an organ donor or say you are a, um, you're on a match somewhere, that they feel like they're not, they <laughs> gotta kill them. <laughs> well, but that, there is that no, they big. Say yeah, they do, they do. And you have to deal with those misconceptions, okay? Um, so, yes, they are one of our lowest participants um, as far as donation, be the match. But actually, your hardest people to match are your biracial individuals, specifically Asian and African American. That combination right there is really, really hard to find an HLA tissue match, okay? And it's kind of, you know, if that's your match, a lot of people try and go out on their own. You'll see postings of, hey, you know, this is my donor type. Can, you, can anybody help? Those types of things. So that's our biggest thing is our biggest hurdle is finding someone who's a close match that we can make it work. Then what we do is once we find the match, we ask that person to donate some stem cells, okay? Now, there's two ways to get stem cells. I always like to tell people it never hurts, okay? It doesn't hurt. You're doing someone a favor. You pay no money. Uh, that's the biggest thing I'll ask, how much is it going to cost me? And it doesn't hurt.
So we're going to watch this video. I'm going to show this. Is, this tells you how we get. What? Okay, here it is. <laughs> If you match a patient, it will cost you no money to donate. We reimburse all travel expenses and provide other assistance as well. You'll be asked to give a blood sample to test whether you are the best possible match for the patient. If you continue, it could take up to 30 to 40 hours total, including travel time, to attend appointments and donate. This is spread out over a four to six week period. You will begin by going to an information session and receiving a physical exam before donating. Be The Match provides you with details and support every step of the way. The patient's doctor will ask you to donate in one of two ways. Today, the most common way to donate is through a procedure called PBSC, or Peripheral Blood Stem Cell Donation. There is no surgery involved. Donors receive daily injections of a drug called filgrastin for five days before collection to increase the blood forming cells in the bloodstream. On the fifth day, some of the donor's blood is removed through a needle in one arm and passed through a machine that separates up the blood forming cells. The remaining blood is returned through the other arm. PBSC donors may experience headaches, bone or muscle aches for several days before collection. These are side effects of filgrastin and typically disappear within six days of donating. PBSC donors can expect to be back to their normal routine in one to two days. The other method of donating cells is marrow donation, which is a surgical procedure. In this type of donation, the donor is anesthetized and feels no pain during the procedure. The doctor inserts a special needle that removes some liquid marrow inside the donor's pelvic bone. Because only 1-5% to of a donor's marrow is taken, the donor's immune system stays strong. The marrow replaces itself completely within 4-6 to six weeks. After marrow donation, a donor may feel some soreness in the lower back for 1-2 to two weeks afterward. Donors can expect to be back to their normal routine in 2-7 to seven days.
So what we're going to do is we're going to give them higher than normal doses of chemo. What we're doing is we are wiping out their immune system. We're killing everything. We're creating a blank slate. Okay? Because remember, their white blood cells don't work anyway. So we are getting rid of it. So think about it. If I'm killing the healthy and the unhealthy cells, what is my patient most at risk for? Infection and or hemorrhage. Okay, so remember that your priority during this whole entire period is preventing infection, preventing bleeding, okay? Uh, we call this period where they have the greatest bone marrow suppression, we call it the NADAR period, okay? They will have a platelet count the majority of the time less than 10,000. Okay, that's really, really low, guys. That means they're at a really high risk of bleeding there. So, this right here, what I always like to tell you that you got to be aware of is, I should say, day 5 through 10, we're given this intense chemo. Then we got to wait two days, okay? Let me tell you why we wait two days before we transfuse. Please try again. Okay. You got it. Okay. So the reason we wait two days is because we got to get all that chemo cleared from that person's system. If we don't get that chemo cleared, uh, what's going to happen when we put these healthy stem cells into that person? That's right. She's going to kill them. So that's why we wait two days. We make sure all the chemo is cleared from that person's body. And then what we do is we start the um, transfusion. Okay? Now, engraftment occurs between 14 and 21 days. That's different than your slide, so change it. I think it's on your slide it says two to something, right? Okay, then that's good. Okay, someone else had some old ones and said something else. So 14 to 21 days. Takes a while, guys, before that engraftment actually happens. So that whole time when you're waiting for engraftment to happen, you better be on the lookout for infection and or bleeding. Okay? So, the way we transfuse these stem cells, we do not use blood administration tubing. Never ever with stem cells do you use blood administration tubing. And I'll tell you why, or I'll show you why right here, okay? Because blood administration tubing has a filter in it, okay? This is what the filter looks like. Well, stem cells are teeny tiny. What happens is the stem cells get caught in that filter. They will never go to the patient. So while stem cells are considered a blood product, we don't use blood administration tubing with them for that reason right there. They're teeny tiny and they'll get stuck in that filtering system, okay? The other thing I always like you um, to remind you is make sure and educate your patients after the um, stem cells has been transfused. Oftentimes your patient will have red urine for a short period of time. So please let them know that before because if you went to the bathroom and you peed and it was blood, you'd get scared. It's normal. It's because of the red blood cell breakdown that is occurring. Okay? Now when you say short term, is like what, a day or two? Uh, usually no more than a week. Okay. Okay? It just depends on how fast they clear everything out, but no more than a week. Okay? okay? And that is completely normal during that time period. So, engraftment, we know it's effective when we do their CBC and we notice they have to start having an increase in their white blood cell counts and then their red blood cell counts. That's when we know engraftment was successful. So remember, engraftment just means that their immune system is being reestablished. That's what it means, engraftment. Okay? So, I know that 14 to 21 days doesn't seem like a long period of time, but when you don't have a functioning immune system, it's a really long time. So most of the time, the patient's in the hospital during this time because they don't have an immune system. That's what you have to realize. They don't. So to try and speed up this process, we give growth factors. That has been found to be a successful in speeding up the process of engraftment. 
You say it directly is successful when they have an increased the white blood cell count. White blood cells and their red blood cell counts. Because remember, um, prior to, like our conditioning regimen, we wiped out everything they had. So they had really low numbers. So when we see those numbers start picking back up, we know that, okay, engraftment's occurring. It's, it's successful now. So then after engraftment occurs and it's successful, then really what we look at is we look at preventing any type of um, complications that can occur, okay? Because there are some complications. Some of the complications that you can see, one is pancytopenia, okay? So remember, pancytopenia is just where the person doesn't have enough circulating blood cells. The reason we worry about pancytopenia, of course, it leads to, or can lead to, infection and or hemorrhage. Another complication that can occur is something called veno-occlusive disease. Now, this actually occurs in about 20% of your patients who have had this procedure, okay? There's no cure for it, guys. Like, we can't magically fix this. So for us, early detection is key. So we're doing daily assessments on these individuals. We're looking at what's their eyes and nose. We're looking at daily weights. Okay? We're measuring abdominal girth. Because remember, in a veno-occlusive you know, disease, what's happening is the liver is being targeted here. So what happens is the inflammation process, and it targets the liver, and what happens specifically, the blood vessels in the liver. Okay, They become clotted off, and they're not able to work anymore. Uh, typically it occurs in the first month following. So because it affects your liver, your signs and symptoms are going to be, that you see are going to be directly related to that. Okay? So what you're going to see is they will become jaundiced. They're going to start complaining of some um, right upper quadrant pain. They're going to develop the ascites. We don't have a way to fix it. All we can do, we put them on stripped eyes and nose and we give supportive therapy. That's it. And I want you to think about why we can't help them. What have you learned about the liver? What do you all know about the liver? Okay, yeah, here's the thing. Remember your liver is very, very vascular. Do we really wanna operate in the liver if we don't have to? No, the answer is no, 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 okay? Do these people already have bleeding issues? Yeah, absolutely. And then you want us to operate on something that's super vascular and going to bleed? No, we do not want to do that. Because a lot of times people say, well, why don't they just go in there and open those vessels back up? Because the person would die of blood loss before we even got to the vessels. So that's all is supportive therapy only and hope that the person can manage it on their own. That they can reestablish blood flow. Because can we live without a liver? Can't live without a liver, okay? So that's why um, it is mostly fatal, okay? I say often, but mostly it is fatal, okay? Another thing that can happen, guys, is graft versus host disease. So in graft versus host disease, what happens here is those donated cells, they recognize the body as foreign and they start attacking it. So they start attacking the person's cells. So the signs and symptoms you're going to see is directly related to the tissue that's being affected. So the tissues that are affected, your skin, your intestinal tract, and your liver. Okay. So what you're going to start seeing in a person who is developing this type of disorder, you're going to start seeing with the skin, you're going to start seeing rashes a change in the actual skin's texture. Here's an example, okay. They're gonna develop, oftentimes they develop peeling of the hands and the feet. When it attacks the intestinal tract, think about it, what do you think your signs are gonna be if something's attacking your intestinal tract? Absolutely. Nausea, vomiting, diarrhea. Okay. And it attacks the liver. Okay? 
So, if something's attacking the liver, what are those signs and symptoms I'm going to see? Yeah, jaundice. Okay, ascites. Okay. So, how do I monitor um, somebody's um, jaundice level? What do I look at? Billy Rubin. You better be checking this person's Billy Rubin level. Okay? Because why do we worry about jaundice? Besides us not wanting our people to look like glow bugs, why do we worry about jaundice? What happens when we have a buildup? Doesn't that affect the brain? And Billy Rubin absolutely it affects the brain. It damages the brain. That's why we want to know what their Billy Rubin levels are. Okay? So make sure and monitor those. So the way we treat graft versus host disease, immunosuppressive drugs. We gotta suppress that immune system, guys. Have to. So usually what you will see given, uh, things such as cyclosporin, methotrexate, and even some corticosteroids. That's what you'll see to try and prevent this complication or try and treat this complication. Now, the worst possible complication that can occur, failure to engraft. Because think about it. What does that mean if it doesn't engraft? What's it mean about that immune system? It had not been established. The person has no immune system. Think you're going to live after this? No, you're not. Our only hope at that point is to try and do another bone marrow transplant and hope it takes. But the likelihood of that is not really good. So if you have a failure to engraft, typically they die from massive infection. Would you use the same donor? You could, if the HLA type is the same, yeah, you can use the same one, but for whatever reason, it just didn't engraft in that person's body. So yeah, you can use the same donor per se, it's just, and we don't know why that happens sometimes, it just does, okay. So these are all the complications that we try and prevent, we're on the lookout for when you're taking care of someone post bone marrow transplant, okay. Now, let's talk about some of the other things that we need to focus on in this population, okay? So we know they're getting chemo and or they've had a bone marrow transplant. So remember the, the two main causes of death, number one is infection, number two is hemorrhage. So our interventions need to be focused around preventing that. So as far as infection, be on the lookout for it. Make sure to monitor those vital signs, guys. Monitor that temp, a slight, Elevation in that temp could mean a major infection for people who have suppressed immune systems. Okay. Be on the lookout for any type of lymph node enlargement. We want to monitor our labs daily. What's your white blood cell count? So we know that bleeding is another concern. So let's avoid invasive procedures if at all possible. Let's also make sure that we are on the lookout for any type of non-healing, skin abrasions, excessive bruising, nose bleeds, okay? bleeding gums, because that's, that's all abnormal. They shouldn't be occurring. Make sure we check all of our body systems. Now, like I said before, we're usually pretty good when we see visible signs of bleeding. It's those ones that we don't necessarily see. So make sure and follow up with any type of complaint of abdominal pain, fullness, ascites, any type of neurological changes you better follow up on. Because sometimes those neurological changes, they're like really insidious, meaning it has a really gradual onset, okay? We need to make sure and follow up they're not having a bleed in their brain. Last, we want to monitor for someone who's at risk for bleeding. Well, let's see what's their platelets, what's their PT, what's their PTT, their INR, okay? Other things that we worry about, Remember, fatigue is a major issue, so they need frequent rest periods. You gotta make sure you educate them and the family on that. There's a lot of frustration because sometimes they don't understand why they don't have the same energy level they did prior to this. So you gotta educate them on it and tell them it's normal. The whole process is normal and they, they will eventually not have the fatigue, but for right now we need to focus on conserving energy when we can, okay? Nutritional support. Oftentimes, we do have to intervene for nutritional support, um, things such as 
Ensure, um, Lucerna, things of those nature, because we need them to have really good nutrition so they can build up their um, albumin levels. So oftentimes we do have to supplement with them. Okay, if nausea, and if nausea and vomiting is the issue, then we try and treat that so that they don't have that issue. Okay. So these are all things that you have to be aware of when you're taking care of this patient. The other thing you have to realize is you've got to provide emotional support. Okay, what I mean by that, remember the diagnosis of leukemia is a major life event. So you have to be your client advocate. Oftentimes you have to mediate between the client and the client's family. And you have to provide education and support. So in your communication with your patient, you need to be open, honest, and direct. If you don't know something, guys, it's okay. There's always going to be times you don't know something. It's okay to tell your patient you don't know. But what you followed up with, I'm unsure of that, but let me find out and I will be back. You make sure you come back and talk with them because what you have to realize is you're establishing a relationship with that patient. Realize the doctor's only in there maybe 15 minutes at the most out of a day. You're there a 12-hour shift. So they feel more comfortable talking to you and asking you questions. And they don't have a problem sometimes putting you on the spot. For example, saying, oh my gosh, the doctors told me I have CLL. Does that mean I'm going to die? How do you answer that? You're open, honest, and direct. Yes, that is a possibility. But this is what we're doing. And go get some education for them. Go print off some stuff. Give them some numbers. Tell them what the usual options are. Like, what do we do for it? So, you know, you don't just say, yeah, we all die. I've had a nurse say that before, and I thought, well, damn, that wasn't very therapeutic there. <laughs> okay? So don't be that one. Sometimes we do have to address the hard questions because nobody else will. And as long as you are open and direct with them, it's okay. Now, you need to be nice with that answer too, okay? Also realize that this is a situation where the patient feels very, very out of control. They don't have a lot of control in this situation. So oftentimes when people don't have control, they're perceived to be, or they could be, very demanding, very controlling. They're the ones that, if you're a minute late with their medicine, they just are all over you. What you have to realize is they don't have control of, over a lot of things in that situation. And so the things that they could have control over, they, have a lot, they want lots of control over it. And what you have to realize at the end of the day, does it hurt? If they want their pills at 9.55 and they're due at 10, is that five minutes gonna hurt? Or if they want you to do a procedure a certain way and it doesn't break any type of sterility or anything like that, is it going to hurt? Give them control over the things that they can actually have control over. Okay? Um, and by doing that, you are just helping build that relationship with that client. Okay? So, I'm going to give y'all a 15 minute break because Quan keeps falling asleep on me. Jay, can you handle that? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you. Okay? So let's take 15 minutes. So it is one, I'll come back at 1.45 and we will start with part two and blood transfusions. I'm gonna get through all of it today. Okay? Okay, don't forget to turn in. Um, at some point before, I need you to turn in your certificate that you know you did your um, blood transfusions and also your Y table. Just put them all right here, make sure your name's on it or your group name is on it for the Y table and I will take those up at the end. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.